meet or all of you and congratulations on this film. Um, but Mrs. Slav, I want to start with you. I mean, what's incredible about this movie is that you can just see the, the, the choices that you're making and the, how you're grappling with the journalistic decisions of, you know, do I help these people? Do I continue documenting? Do, what, what, you know, h- how did you reconcile those choices in, in real time and, you know, determine even what footage you wanted to include for the same reasons, you know, as you're, yeah, making those editorial decisions. You know, the interesting thing is that, first of all, this film wasn't shot as a film in the very beginning, it was shot as a news dispatches. So they were sent daily. And then only after, after we broke out of the city and we, I, you know, I had around 30 hours of footage comparing to around 40 minutes that we have been able to send and we started to assemble the film. We started going through the footage. And then that's where the amazing Michelle Meissner's editor work is coming. She has she have found and you know we found these reactions, or my reactions to people or my interactions with people, which we, we I didn't even remember were there. I wasn't just my camera was on. But I never included them in the news in the news footage, and obviously I forgot about it completely. So that was a discovery for me too. And then we decided to put them in the film because we really wanted to, uh, first of all, to convey the feeling that the whole film crew and you know me personally, we are the part of the community we're telling the story about. Afghani's the photographers. Uh, Hometown is a neighboring town to Mariupol and got occupied even before Mariupol. We both from a, an eastern eastern part of Ukraine, from Kharkiv, and that that is uh, that city was also under heavy fire. So we feel that this is our story too. So it is quite natural to to try to help people, to to try to to be part of of their life whenever they need someone to help you with. And I think that that what yeah that what makes this film. That's that what makes the audience feel like a part, part of that experience. You know, be there. I mean, you were yeah, as you said early on, you were just there to report and to document, and not you're not there to make a film, but you're you're on the front lines. And I think what's amazing is that some of your footage is some of just the defining footage of of what we've seen in the Western world of, of this war. And were were you realizing this, like, as you were there, just, you know, what the, the message was or what that your work is like, Hey, this is, we, we, this is important or we need to keep going because, um, yeah, because this is the only stuff that, that people are actually seeing and understanding about what's happening here. Uh, First of all, until we left the city, and until quite later, we didn't understand how much impact the work we did have on the international society, on the world's response to Russia's invasion in Ukraine. And probably until now, I still, I'm still trying to understand what kind of like my hope it did have an impact, and that's why it's one of the reasons why I wanted to do this film because I felt like those small news pieces, which went out 30 seconds, one minute, 90 90 seconds, they were informative. And people knew about the tragedies in Mariupol, about all those deaths and injuries and suffering and destruction. However, it was not enough. I really wanted to give more context, more depth, show uh, in what conditions that footage was made. But what's more important is what happened to those people before and after. So give, give the audience a chance to, to, to stay longer with, with, with these people who are suffering, who are losing their loved ones, to, to understand the scale of the destruction. Early on in the movie, you have a very powerful moment in which you tell a woman, like, go home, it, it'll be safe, they, they won't bomb, you know, civilian areas and you say an hour later, I was wrong. And that's just jaw drop dropping. Um, w- take me through in real time, your 
reaction to that, that when you realized what was going on and then later when you were able to reconnect with that woman. In the beginning of the invasion, uh, when we went to Mariupol, it was 23rd, night of 23rd of February, and we arrived an hour before the war started. We went to Mariupol not knowing what would be the scale of the invasion, you know, where we, we knew that the invasion is going to start. We expected that, but we didn't know where exactly and how big it's going to be. And for certain, we had no idea how violent it's going to be, like how far they would go to just to get what they want. So, and that was the first day. And so we really didn't know what was going on. No one was. And I was hoping that when I speak to that woman, I, I really express my hope that it's not going to be this way. They're not going to shell civilian uh, houses, you know, they're not going to kill people. Uh, but, you know, I was wrong. What can I say? I was wrong. So, yes, um, knowing, knowing the story, this war is not, uh, hasn't started uh, on 24th of February. It started nine years ago. Russia invaded Ukraine nine years ago. Judging by that, I, I could kind of, I should have understood that they will destroy Mariupol, but I was hoping that's not going to happen. As producers and editors, are you <clears throat> looking at this footage and deciding, hey, you know, this this moment in particular, we need to include that for for posterity or to to really show, you know, his own journey on on screen as a reporter. But what, what was take me through some of the, the thinking behind that in the editing process? I think we knew that there were key moments that the world had already seen, actually, and had seen in these short news packages and had impacted people moments in time, but like over a number of days. And so we knew that it would be a different experience seeing them in the film and with all the context around them of, you know, how did they see the bomb fall onto the maternity hospital? You know, where were they when that happened? And you see him running to it. And I think there were conversations around, you know, how much of um, Mstislav is in the film. He was really interested in not being the main focus and he really didn't want it to become about him or about the journalists and about them. Um, but also that does provide a way for a viewer to understand how things all connected. And he was the person who kind of took us through that experience in those 20 days. And what happened to them was important and what they did was so important. So it wasn't, it was a good thing to include um, their perspective. So I think we tried to, yeah. you know, get that right. Um, and, and that's how we selected some of the shots. But, but also the idea, idea for including a, a journalistic work uh, in a film was based on that we wanted to, you know, there's a lot of misinformation and propaganda connected with, with all these stories. So another thing which we're trying to do is to show how information and misinformation, how ripples, these ripples of these events uh, influence the media space around the world. So we've included these news sequences, uh, footage of, of uh, Russian news saying that all we film is fake and calling us information terrorists. So that is also a part of a journalistic experience. That is a part of where it's connecting with the audience. As a producer, are, are you looking at this footage and, and saying, you know, what, what are the what are your challenges in saying what can we include what what can we be safe about or how do we keep other people safe the identities of people safe things of things of that nature like uh, before Mariupol I didn't know what war is yeah so I just uh, happened in this place and uh, then I saw like the first kid died in my eyes and only saw that they had that whole world should see it how it could happen in like our normal life in 21 century. And uh, for me as a producer, I wanna like show everything that we saw and everything that we felt. 
And I think that this movie really shown how our feelings, yeah, Mr. Slav feelings, and this is so important because it's for us as Ukrainians, as humans, and like everyone, I think it's re really important to everyone to feel it. But at the same time, a, a journalistic lens is just a lens, really, and that was not the purpose. The purpose was to connect all the stories and to show them, to introduce the tragedies, to, to get the audience to know people who are suffering closer. So just, just the way, so journalists are not the main characters in the film, they're just a perspective that connects everyone. And the main thing is what is happening to the city, the destruction, the loss, the panic. Were you surprised that the hostility early on towards towards journalists and towards the media and then to see how that evolved for the very reason of what you just said, that there's so much misinformation and propaganda that's not getting back to people in Russia? Like, was, it was Did that shock you to see that evolution among people in Ukraine? Well, there have been always very different responses from from Ukrainians to journalism. Like, look, the, the problem the problem of information and fake news and and just people reacting in a different way to to journalists. I don't think is exclusive for Ukraine or exclusive for the conflict. Is a larger theme that is going on in the world right now. How do people see journalists? How they interact with journalists? How they trust? The journalists. So, for that matter, uh, it was important for us to show, include in the film, all the range of responses, all the all kinds of reactions. There's people who want to say something, but at the same time they want to offend, just offend the journalist, or to the people who really happy to see a journalist because they need to send a message to their loved ones, or to the ones who are just coming to us on the street and saying. Please show these cows. Uh, like, I don't need anything, but just please let the world know how things are. Or the doctor who's trying to save a child and can't save the child, just saying, show this to Putin. All of these, all of these reactions, when they put together, they kind of give a viewer a perspective of, again, how journalists work, but at the same time, the, the wide range of, of feelings and, and and conflicts which are happening within within humans in conflict like this is uh, yeah humanity is the focus of this film not the fighting not the bombs a, the human feelings is the is our focus is this the the jacket that you wear over there like to people identify you? you've got the press oh yeah this is actually this is <laughs> This is a jacket I was wearing in Mariupol, yeah. Wow. And I didn't realize that, but this is a working jacket, yeah. We, we all clearly, we wear uh, press signs on the helmets and, yeah. and on our chests. So we are always identifying ourselves as a press. And that is quite interesting. So when you go around when, in, in the times when there was an, absolutely no connection in the city, you would just go on the street and people would crowd around you and would say, hey, you are the press. What are the news? Tell us, tell us what's happening in Kiev or tell us what's happening in, in, in just another neighborhood here. They were kind of supposed that we know the news. And I tried to, you know, I called the editor on the satellite phone and first thing I asked, so tell me the news because people are going to ask me, what are the news? Take me through your escape from getting getting out and um you know what what was that like for you and and it sounds like i mean yeah the locals in building that trust as a journalist enabled you to help do that and to lead your escape talk about that a little bit the audience will see that in the film unfortunately i wasn't able to film as we are going through the russian checkpoints as they're checking our car, our documents, and our car is completely destroyed, pierced by shrapnel, and there are no windows, just a scotch tape on it. So it kind of blocks the view on the checkpoints, which we are lucky uh, that they haven't seen our faces. Um, so yeah, we had to, we lost in, a, in when the hospital was taken over, uh, we lost our car, we escaped on foot, and. The audience will see that in the film, our escape from the hospital, but we left the, har the car behind. So we found ourselves just being unable to even 
you know, just move around the city, work. Nevertheless, they didn't escape, right? Uh, but uh, yes, the, the policeman that was with us, uh, that helped us in the last days, he also risked his life and you know, safety for, of his family. He took us in his car and as soon as the first humanitarian corridor was open, they, they tried to take us out from, from the city and that worked because first days were very chaotic. So we, we were going through 15 checkpoints, you know, cameras and hard drives hidden, and flag jackets hidden. We should have left them in the city though, but okay. I'm glad we took them anyway. And the car is full of bags and Russians are checking our documents and this family and Every checkpoint we arrive, uh, Vladimir's wife just praying. I can hear her praying. We crossed all these checkpoints and at night, we don't see already where we are driving, but we arrive at the next checkpoint. And instead of Russian, we hear a Ukrainian language. And she bursts into tears at that moment. Again, I should have filmed it, but Something interesting about hearing him tell this story, I, we, when we, with the footage that you did have, um, it would have been easy to make the end of the film and them escaping feel like a success, happy at the end, they got out, relief. It was really important that it didn't feel like that because mm -hmm. they felt not, not a sense of, they were grateful, but they felt a lot of guilt. Um, and I think working um, in the edit on how to get that across without allowing the audience to just feel like, okay, everything's fine now, but really turn it back, turn the lens back to the people that were left behind. Because of course, <clears throat> this is still ongoing and it's <clears throat> a, a real crisis, but I mean, for you, how, how are you continuing your work? Or, or have you still been able to communicate with with people, with sources, with, with people on the ground and I mean, what what is the, the condition as it stands today? First of all, unfortunately, Mariupol is completely destroyed. It's a ghost town and um, maybe 1% uh, of the buildings has been rebuilt only and probably it will never be the same. And it's under occupation and uh, most of the uh, most of the characters we met, most of the characters sto whose stories we tell, they have left the city and uh, we keep in contact with them. Um, we make sure they receive all the help they need. But what I really try to, this film already screened three times and the audience response was very strong and very emotional. And every time I speak to the audience, I'm just trying to tell them that, look, you've just seen a film which is called 20 Days in Mariupol, but it's really a time frame. And there was day 21 and 22 and 30 and now it's almost a year of the full-scale invasion almost nine years to an invasion so that's not that happened something that happened and and it's over that's that happens every day right now take a look at bakhmut bakhmut right now is also being surrounded and being completely destroyed so that is kind of the tactics russian russians kept using throughout the whole war. They just come, they surround the city, they level it to the ground, they take it. Then they go to the next one, level it to the ground, then they take it. So Mariupol is a symbol because it was the first. Uh, and it's a symbol for the world, how the world really supported Ukraine, gathered around Ukraine and supported. And it's a sim symbol for Ukrainians. It's like a first loss, first grief, and it's a symbol for us, too, as journalists.